there was a C-27, Ukrainian, a C-27 that was shot down, I think the second day of the war. And it was shot down over Kiev. And it, are you tracking this? Do you hear what happened? Why no, it got I, shot down? No. It got shot down by an SA-21 in Belarus. So that's, it's about, a, it was about a 150 mile SAM shot. And it yeah. shot down the C-27 over its own capital and from another country. Boom. Paco, thanks for joining me back on the podcast, man. Happy to have you back on here. Talk some no-fly zones. For those who haven't heard, Paco joined me for episode 40. He is wrapping up his time in the Air Force. He's done a lot of good stuff. He's much smarter than me, so it'll be fun to, to chat about no-fly zones with him today. You can check him out, the Merge newsletter. I think that's a great resource for those looking for DOD defense-type knowledge. It's, it drops every Sunday, so you can go over to the Merge.co and sign up for that. Explore more on Patreon. But Paco, thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's kind of a, you know, you're on the road and, and I'm juggling chainsaws here. So thanks for yeah. taking some time to talk about this. Dude, we're making it happen. Yeah, I'm sitting in New Delhi as we record this. You're, you know, back in the state. So modern technology, it makes things happen. So with all that being said, man, I, I want to, obviously there's a lot of things going on in the world. Ukraine is the hot topic right now. The past few days, no fly zones have popped up in the news. People, I think, have thrown that out there is that it's like an easy solution to go out there and help the Ukrainian people out. I think there's a little bit more to it uh, with no fly zones. With that, you wrote an article for War on the Rocks. Can you kind of give a history, a background of no fly zones and what they are? Yeah, sure. Uh, so there was a poll. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the history, to, but I got to start with this poll. There's a poll about four days ago, five days ago, about uh, no fly zones. And he just asked, you know, the uh, general American uh, public. And 74% of the people responding to that poll said they were for a no fly zone. But I think 99% of them actually don't know what a no fly zone is. <laughs> so that was pretty <laughs> insightful. Uh, and there was a, <laughs> there's another poll uh, that I saw that basically broke it down by demographics of who was for and against. And it was really insightful because basically everyone that was 55 and older in the poll was, uh, was for a no fly zone. And everyone that was under the age of 55 was pretty much opposed to the no fly zone. And, and the reason why that poll I thought was really interesting is you know, being a fan of history, you know, all those over 55 card carrying members of the, you know, senior citizen club, they, they were adults in the nineties when the, this whole idea of a no fly zone actually became a thing. And so they, they grew up as adults right after Desert Storm, Northern Watch Provide Comfort in Northern Iraq had started. And we basically started a 20 years of enforcing a no-fly zone in the north. 1992, we started Southern Watch, which is enforcing a no-fly zone of Iraq in the south. And what people don't remember is that, you know, that happened immediately after Desert Storm. So we were enforcing a no-fly zone against an adversary that we had just went to war with. The calculus there, it's, there's no escalation to be had because we just ended the war against the people that we're enforcing the no-fly zone against. The, which, you know, when you think about it that way, it's like, oh, that makes sense. And, and, and it's interesting right. because, you know, policymakers at the time, back in the early 90s, they took that same principle, said, well, if it worked in Iraq, like, this is a new thing. And in the about a year, year and a half after Desert Storm had ended, when the no-fly zone started in Iraq, Bosnia had kicked off. And so there was, this. if this works in Iraq, it has to work in Bosnia. So Bosnia, um, there was a no-fly zone for that. And so that was Operation Deny Flight. And an interesting thing about the dynamics of that, what makes it different, is that it was only focused on keeping fixed-wing aircraft out of this basically blue-controlled land. So there was no bad guys underneath any of the, any of the people who were flying around. It was a border patrol for fixed-wing. It didn't work against helicopters for a few reasons. And, and, and the big takeaway from that is even though it was, it was supposed to be enforcing 
this the sanctity of uh, basically homeland defense for another country it still didn't work <laughs> and yeah. that, there was there was some attacks there was some retali- some retaliation that was the f-16 shooting down the uh, the serbian fighters they shot down four fighters after they bombed a uh, a factory in bosnia and then it started escalating from there and at the end of the day, uh, I think what most people remember out of Bosnia was Scott O'Grady. And anyone that has anything to do with the Air Force remembers uh, Captain yeah. Scott O'Grady. So he was shot down on an F-16 over good guy land, flying a cap, enforcing a no-fly zone, just doing a, re- a routine patrol, and SA-6 shot him down. Which then, obviously, that led into his evasion, his recovery, and then you know, that escalated into... Uh, deliberate force, which was a month of retaliatory strikes uh, directly against, you know, hostile forces. So the lessons from Bosnia, which is different from what happened in Iraq, is that we it did escalate and it did put us into direct conflict with an opposing force that we were not there to, to fight. We were there to just protect the, the good guys and we ended up fighting the bad guys. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that it's just like the easy button, like you just go do this. As you mentioned, you know, Northern Watch and Southern Watch were on the tail end of defeating an enemy, so there was no one to contest. And now, when you actually go into an environment that's contested, and I say that lightly because Bosnia is a much different environment than Ukraine or Russia might be. Yeah, exactly. And again, most people don't, I don't think most people understand the amount of resources that go into something like that. And, you know, all the things that we're talking about is in a different era where we had a different technological advantage. We had a size of the force and you can kind of go on and on. The yeah. The one example that's probably the most applicable is is looking at the numbers behind what happened in Kosovo in the late 90s. And so we went, we went there and it wasn't a no-fly zone, but we went there to try to do some limited airstrikes and, and, uh, and Operation Allied Force. And so we knew at the very beginning of the conflict, there are 44 known surface to air missile sites. We knew, we knew where they were, they were moving around. What we couldn't do is ever achieve air supremacy. And because we couldn't air, achieve air supremacy, we ended up expending a lot of resources. So we shot, and you're an F-16 guy, so you'd appreciate this. We shot almost 750 harms. <laughs> a lot of harms. At those 44 SAMs in, yeah, in less than three months. That had been <laughs> a lot of harms. And I think, uh, and I think the, the other number that, that stood out to me is in defensive reactions, the Air Force expended over 1,500 tow decoys. Jeez. It's a, just the yeah, electronic yeah. back and forth of this, of this campaign, which is, again, it was less than three months long. And at the end of the day, we still lost an F-117 and an F-16 to enemy fire. But we were enabled. The big takeaway, though, is although that was about airstrikes, we were never able to achieve air supremacy. And so all of our wide body command and control and ISR, like your rivet joint, your J-stars, tankers, all of them actually had to hold off the coast so they wouldn't be threatened because we didn't know where all the threats were. We couldn't, you know, make sure that they weren't going to get attacked. And so because of that, you know, by definition, you know, we were never able to achieve air supremacy. We achieved air superiority. And the big takeaway from that is to establish a no-fly zone, you need to establish air supremacy. And there's no modern, there's no historical example that we've ever been able to achieve an air supremacy to do that against anyone who wants to take that air back. So obviously Afghanistan, we had air supremacy, Iraq and Iraqi freedom and all the operations that followed, we had air supremacy, but that's because no one challenged us. And so there's no historical in, in no point in history has everyone that's tried to, to fight to get the air back, we we always lost it and it went back to air superiority, which is the kind of the, the doctrinal differences. I know, you know, words mean things, they're slightly different, but it matters because if you're going to put a no-fly zone over Ukraine and we lose one American pilot and an American jet gets shot down, now we have an American pilot on the ground and the complexities of uh the diplomatic relationships and the threat of escalation and pulling people into a direct conflict is, uh, you know, it's a real thing. It's huge. So pulling on that thread just a little bit, and we obviously have to watch where we go with this, but the 30,000 or the 50,000 foot view comparing, you know, 44 known fixed SAM sites, in Bosnia is shooting 750 plus harms, which is a lot or what, 1,500 tow decoys deployed, as you said, again, against 44 known sites. 
which is relatively small. Comparing that to what someone might face in Ukraine, how do those two compare? And that's, again, only a surface-to-air threat. We're not even talking an air-to-air threat. Yeah, so you know we can pull a thread on the surface to air. So yeah, obviously there's there's man portable air defenses, but you can negate most of those through altitude. But the problem is now that you're in that higher, you know, it's called block two, block three, you're in your you know twenty thousand feet or above kind of altitude, safe from your man pads, everyone can see you. So uh, the there was a Su twenty seven Ukrainian a Su twenty seven that was shot down. I think the second day of the war, and it was shot down over Kiev. And it, are you tracking this? Do you hear what happened? Why no, it got I, shot down? No. It got shot down by an SA-21 in Belarus. So that's, it's about, a, it was about a 150 mile SAM shot. And it yeah. shot down the C-27 over its own capital from another country. Just like the 25 year difference in that technology gap, right? That's, that's a big difference. You sprinkle that in there, the capability yeah, absolutely. Engaged. Yeah, like this, get real sporty, real fast. Yeah, and people, you know, and people say, well, that's why we buy the F-35, right? Or, you know, a stealth aircraft. Like, well, again, you have to know how particularly fighter stealth works. It's a certain band and a certain aspect and a certain range for a certain reason. It's If you're going to orbit over a point for hours on end, you're not hiding from anyone, no matter how, you know, quote, stealthy you might be. Well, I, I had not heard the SA-21 shot from Belarus. But that just goes to show, like, how complex this scenario is and that's just one one piece of a very big puzzle here and so if we in the now pull on the air-to-air threat like that's not something i mean it was it had to be dealt with in bosnia right there were some amram shots but the this scale is much different i think yeah, and I'd say the it kind of goes back to like what's the point of a no fly zone? Ignoring the the logistics and the threats and everything. At the end of the day, um, the if we look at the Ukrainian population, you know the threat from them is not from the air. They're being attacked from rockets, mortars, and artillery that are all surface based. So even if we were to put a no fly zone, and it wouldn't actually protect them from attack because most the the Russians are not using combined arms right now. So they do have some limited attacks, but you know, overwhelming majority of the threats to civilians and to the Ukrainian forces is from attack from the ground, not the air, which is another nuance that people don't understand. So why do you think there is a call for this? Yeah, I think some of it goes back to. Uh, Mis, uh, misunderstanding the history of the no-fly zone. I think there's a, there's obviously an emotional tug in everyone's hearts around the world right now to do something. And, you know, that gets conflated of like, well, a no-fly zone is something. But quickly you get into like, well, that, you know, that means that we're going to be in direct conflict with an opposing force, which is Russia. So do you, and it's funny, if there was another poll that came out that says, do you, you know, do you support a no-fly zone? And the overwhelming majority said yes. It was like, again, 70%. And then they rephrased the question, like, do you suppose, do you support enforcing a no-fly zone if it puts uh, U.S. forces in direct conflict with Russia? And they said, no. Like, well, what, that's literally what a no-fly zone is. Like, you're, it's not a half-hearted <laughs> measure. It is a, it is a tool and a toolkit for an air campaign. It, you're committing a, to a full air campaign. Now, besides the, the nuances of a Russia v. You know, U.S. or NATO, the logistics that are required to pull off something like that. Uh, Ukraine is not a small country. It's the largest country in Europe. Yeah. I mean, it, it is much larger than you think. And the way that NATO, uh, this is, you know, from 30 years or 20 years or so that it's been set up, most of the NATO infrastructure is on the western side of Europe. The nearest airfield, I think, is 200 miles from the border. And then you go, okay, well, if I wanted to do something over Kiev, that's another 200 miles inside the border. So that's you know, 400 miles from, from the base. Where, where are my tankers? Where, where's my command and control? Like, how am I going to, you know, put someone way out in front alone and unafraid right over the forces that are, are potentially going to shoot me down with an itchy trigger finger, which again, the threat of escalation is extreme because there's so many variables that are beyond the control of Russia at that point. You know, it could be a, some 18-year-old with a uh, with a man pad just gets up and sees something and shoots it down. Or it could be Ukrainian military. There was a lot of frats, blue right. and blue, in the in the first uh, couple of days, just a fog and frictional war. And man, it's, yeah, the, 
it is way more complicated than I think people want to spend the brain bites to understand, but they want to offer a solution. I'd say a no-fly zone is not a solution to this problem. Yeah, the no-fly zone is like the warm blanket because for the past 30 plus years, it's always, we've had air supremacy pretty much everywhere we've gone. So you never really have thought about it. You go throw air power out there. Everyone is happy. Everyone, everyone goes home at night, but that's just not the case when you're talking about an opposing force like Russia. And as you mentioned, you know, not to knock, uh, you know, a Patriot battery, one of our, you know, Patriot batteries is probably being operated by 18, 19 and a 24 year old sitting in there. And you can imagine the same thing is happening on the, on the Russian side of the house. So again, it just takes one who's cut off from communication, thinks they're being attacked or whatever it might be. And then it kicks off into a much larger conflict than we're currently seeing. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And I'd say the last thing, which I didn't foot stomping enough, you know, the whole point of a no-fly zone is you're enforcing the fact that it's a no-fly zone. So you can put an aircraft there, <laughs> but at some point, someone's got to have to call your bluff. And then, and then it gets down to like, well, what do I do? If I, if I enforce it, then you're talking about shooting down and, and, you know, a Russian aircraft or shooting at a Russian air defense site. And if I don't enforce it, well, now I've lost the whole point of, you know, the deterrence part of the no-fly zone anyways, which gets into the the huma- the, the rebranding of this as a, a safe zone slash humanitarian zone. And there's been some, some, some retired retired old officers who, who may think that that's the way to go. But again, if it's a, if it's a diplomatic action to have a ceasefire zone, then enforcing that with mil- the, the military kind of underpins the, it undermines the whole point of having the diplomacy in the first place. Yeah. So if, you know, let diplomacy work, establish those ceasefire zones and, you know, get the civilians where they need to go out of Ukraine. The big difference. Yeah, and I think the one aspect, because I don't know much, right, but th- there are no walls in the sky, right? So if you actually go and had to implement this no-fly zone while we are talking about the confines of Ukraine on the earth, I think that quickly can expound into all of Europe, right? I mean, it, it can very quickly be a, instead of having to guard a 40-mile wide lane times eight or whatever that might be, now you're guarding, you know, 20, 40-mile wide lanes, protecting from the, the air threat rolling in from Russia. And as you alluded to, the SA-21 shot from Belarus, this is a pretty complicated problem to have to go out there and solve. Yeah, and it's and it's very it's a very nonlinear battlefield. So again, if you look at the escalation and deterrence, you know, there's two batteries, uh, SA-21 batteries in Belarus that Russia have moved in there about a month before the invasion that are just happened to be due north of Kiev. And those are, you know, 200-mile threat rings and you know each battery has some missile system so you have eight sa-21s that are sitting north of kiev and oh by the way you know don't forget about kaliningrad which also has sa-21s that kind of cover half of poland it's right so the threat the threat of escalation like it, that no-fly zone if you did it may start over you know western or north central uh, ukraine but it isn't going to stay there all right before we wrap up i know this is your opinion your opinion only so Two two questions. One, what, what what would be Paco's solution to this? And then just to play devil's advocate, and actually I think I know where it's going to go. How would you actually go out there and implement a no fly zone if we had to go do it here? Okay. Well, if you read the merge last week, I talked about dime, and I, there is a there is this is a really good way to do a indirect military or non military instrument of power application. So. Let diplomacy work. You can see what's going on. The world is turning against Russia. This is going to set Russia back a generation. It's fracturing fracturing a relationship with China and Russia, which is exactly what the United States wants. So while the crisis in Ukraine, it sucks, the the application of diplomacy, economic uh, sanctions, and our, the I.O. campaign that's being run by Ukraine is completely destroying Russia on the world stage. And, and it's going to, I said, it'll take a generation to try to recover that. And it might not be recoverable. And obviously it also speaks against uh, Putin. But that being said, if you were to enforce a no-fly zone, again, the logistics would be ridiculous. You know, you're talking about multiple fighter squadrons because we're not, again, we're assuming we're not putting boots on the ground. And so there's no air defense systems that we're going to deploy inside Ukraine. Um, 
And even the ones that you deploy along the borders, because of the way that Ukraine, Belarus and is set up, you only have the western edge of Ukraine that you really share a border with a NATO country that's involved in the, the geographic area of interest. So yeah, you could deploy a Patriot or something along the border, but it's really not going to help that much. So you're talking about aircraft. And aircraft, you're talking about a no-fly zone, which means 24-hour operations. And the amount of area that you're talking about, you know, Kosovo was, was a, if you look at how many, like 100,000 sorties we flew in Kosovo, Ukraine is 50 times larger than, than <laughs> Kosovo. The, the, just the areas that people are talking about over uh, Western Ukraine and, and Northern Ukraine around Kyiv, those areas, just that little area is 10 times larger than anything that we've ever tried to enforce before. So the geographic complexity of this is enormous. And then you look at the logistics, you know, I have a tanker that's, you know, 150, 200 miles away, and it has to be that far away because I don't want it to get shot down. And there's no divert airfields where I'm over because I'm over basically a uncontrolled territory because there's a fight for air superiority going on right now between Russia and Ukraine, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, to have air parity is kind of going on as a one-to-one, -one, let alone there is no air supremacy or air superiority. So you have to kind of white card all of those things just to get to the point of how you could do it. And the amount of fighter squadrons you'd have to deploy and the amount of tankers, the amount of command and control just for this thing that's not going to work anyways, it, it is, a, it's a dumb idea. <laughs> and I just, yeah, the reason I talk about it, <laughs> and, I, and this is an education campaign, you know, the more people know about like, oh, I didn't think about this. Oh, I didn't think about that. Like, yeah, that's why we have professionals that do this for a living. And, right. you know, the people who know what it takes to do and what it is and what it isn't, uh, those are the ones we should be listening to. And they're all saying this is not a good idea. But I, I totally get the emotional tug to 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 try to offer a solution. Uh, but and the fact that the, the Ukrainian the civilians, you know, they remember what a no-fly zone was back in the 90s, so they're asking for it. But again, they don't understand what they're asking for. Right. This thing changes really quickly, I think, once you implement a no-fly zone, because as you said, someone's bluff is going to get called, and then AMRAMs are going to be slung, and then this this thing really escalates into something that's probably out of the control of everyone at that point. So not where you want to be in life. No, not at all. <laughs> well, hey, Paco, any parting shots? I really appreciate you taking the time and just kind of, you know, share some of the knowledge. Again, War on the Rocks. Uh, Paco wrote an article there, but really the Merge newsletter. You can go to merge.co and find or subscribe to the newsletter. You can see the archives. The newsletter he just mentioned is there. Again, it comes out every Sunday. It's a great little knowledge bomb for defense and military-related items. 